up in the poetry bomb. Somebody was just looking at the building back here and they're like looking at fanny packs and they're like, fanny packs and poetry, this is a cool idea because they wanted to buy stuff. <laughs> I don't know if fanny packs go with poetry or not, but I'm going to share poetry with you. Um, and these are all from the book On the Edge, CC and D Boss Lady Collection book, volume 5 actually. Um, this is from the show. I believe it's from the show. Mm. This poem is called Eat Me Alive. I had a dream. I woke up in a sewer. My clothes were wet from the filthy water. It felt like something was pulling me down into the filth, and I worked harder and harder to just stand. And I thought, how did I get here? Who put me here? How on earth can I get out of here? Who, who drove me to this point? I felt the slimy, filthy walls out of the, this coffin-like cave as I was trying to find a ledge for support, trying to find my way out. The noise from people walking above ground was muffled when I heard some cats then coming along from the water near from the end of the tunnel. And so I turned in the darkness to run until I tried to take a turn and I was wedged in an actual concrete slab. I, I was stuck in the sewer and the rats were going to eat me alive. That's just a weird run, if that's a dream. This one is called Escape My Brain Somehow. Thinking is a demon. Sleepless surrounds me. <laughs> Shall meditate, rise above it all, get to a higher plane of existence. I wish I knew how to escape my brain. <laughs> Maybe then I could actually get a night's rest. There are times I hear that delusions are mentally insane, and and they, and they hear these ex, extra, ex, existential ramblings, and they call this nonsensical blather, and they hear this all, and some meditate to a higher plane, and some psychotically, psychologically, yeah, try to improve it by just imagining something altogether different. So. When I was stuck in this corner like this, and my brain is still reeling, I wish I could just be crazy sometimes. Let my mind imagine people. Let me think that I see more than everyone else. Even if I imagine that the world would be out to get me, it would still be something I'm imagining. At least I could just justify it by saying that is that I was just all so important by imagining that they're out to get me. But if I fantasize like this, if my fantasies like this gave me demons, I still wouldn't be able to sleep. This one is <clears throat> would be more fitting if it was December 6th when we went to visit. It's called Broke the Reflection. I dropped my mother's ashes down into the water. I, I wanted them to sink down, but they just floated there as they broke the reflection of the sun. It reminded me of Oahu in 2001. It was the 60th anniversary of the day that lived in infamy. When over the USS Arizona, I could only photograph with my mind the flowers I saw dropped from another survivor that floated along the water breaking the tension of the oil still rising from that sunken battleship. My face was ashen as everything, too, broke the reflection of the sun. So, Kevin in Chicago at an open mic said that this poem should be called My First Time. I think he had other things in mind when he said that. Yeah. But it's called my first time. 
There are some towns known for their food. New Orleans has its po' boy, Philadelphia has its Philly cheesesteak. And if you're in New York and you want to carry food on the street, you better get a pizza slice, fold it in half, and eat it with you in one hand. And if you're in Chicago and you can't eat a deep dish pizza with one hand in the street, you better get a Chicago style hot dog with yellow mustard, relish, that bright green kind, hot peppers, tomatoes, onions, celery salt, and a pickle on top. I lived in Chicago all my life, frequented the tops of skyscrapers, visited legendary blues bars, but even when I was a meat eater, I never had a Chicago hot dog. Just ketchup, please. And I'll take the pickle on the side, and, and I don't even like hot peppers. But when we left the planetarium today, I passed a Chicago hot dogs vendor cart, and they listed vegetarian hot dogs as one of the choices for the Chicago hot dog. I passed it, and then I stopped, walked back, and asked for a vegetarian hot dog with everything except the hot peppers. And no, ketchup is not included when you say everything. <laughs> And when I got my paper rack vegetarian Chicago hot dog, I was tempted to pull off the pickle and pull it away, but then he had to remind me, no, that's a part of the Chicago hot dog. So I put it all together, took a bite, and then I took another, and another. And I thought, I've been missing out on this fantastic Chicago tradition all my life. I heard the Chicago hot dogs started during the Depression because it was something cheap that you could sell on the street. And it was a complete meal, a full meal, meat, bread, vegetables, and all at a reasonable price. And I thought, we Chicagoans had all figured out with our gooey deep dish pizza when you had the time to sit down, as well as a way to make any hot dog taste awesome whenever you wanted a treat on the streets. <laughs> Bless his soul. This was written for Warren. These next ones will be. This one's called It's Someone's Job. It's someone's job to stitch the eyes and lips of a corpse. It's someone's job to take a generic beige powder and concealer to give my friend the color of life. It's someone's job to trim the facial hair that extrudes after death. It's someone's job to style a corpse's hair so it doesn't look like the one you love. It's not my job to think of these things when you're on one side of the coffin. It's not fair that we see the powder along your face, that we see the powder on your hands and also on your nails. It's not right to see you like this. Why must we make you up like this? It's not the way you live. It shouldn't be the way you look after you die. It's someone's job to staple you shut to make you look more alive. It's someone's job to cosmetically placate our fears, to make us not see what your body has become. It's someone's job to keep our fantasy going because we thought you'd stop living and, and we can't cope with your dying. Before I can put a smile on my face again, I'll try to smile on this one, I will. I'll try. I'm sorry. This isn't a 10 minutes with Warren feature. So. When the people who organized your high school class reunion found out that you had ALS, and for the past six months you were bound to a wheelchair, they moved up the reunion date to the fall because they wanted to make sure that you were alive long enough so that all of your high school friends could see you once more. And I thought, wait a minute, Stephen Hawking has ALS and he's lived for decades with, while bound to a real chair. They're really jumping the gun here. You're, you're not going to die. 
since I didn't go to school with you, I wrote our band name on my name tag to a, as a, at a class reunion held at your favorite local bar. <laughs> Saw you there in your wheelchair, now unable to speak, but, but still holding court with all the girls from your high school days. Yeah, in your high school yearbook, you were rated the biggest flirt. <laughs> So all the girls still swooned and you periodically played pre-programmed messages in the computerized Stephen Hawking voice. When you saw me, you told me I looked really beautiful today. And I blushed. What am I supposed to do? And I heard you later on with your swooning women telling them one by one that they looked really beautiful today. <laughs> And it made me smile. And then John was there, and you were, and and when you had complimented one more woman, how she was so beautiful. That's when the man responded, loud enough for the group to hear. Stop complimenting me like that in front of everybody. <laughs> this guy says that to him. <laughs> and everyone had a good laugh, reminding me of how you always put a smile on everyone's face, how you crack jokes, how you make everyone smile. Later in the evening, I saw your saw your buddy is, and you asked him, and they asked you if you wanted a drink, and you agreed on rum. So he got some in a syringe and he injected it into a tube. It's hard to see you like that, you know. You were always the one cracking the chips, placating or driving to my place in Chicago to practice music with me or, or joining me at bars for our performances. You drove to central Illinois with me to perform live at a local radio station. But before we appeared on the air, you kept singing a one popular song because it repeated your wife's name. Oh yeah, I'm far away. And it's hard to see you like this now when there's nothing I can do for you. After the reunion, I couldn't call you to tell you how I felt. If you could have answered, you wouldn't have wanted to hear it. No matter what you were doing, though, you didn't want to hear others tell you how seeing you made them suffer. How selfish of them. You're the one that's knocking on death's door. Everyone else needs to keep on their happy face. It's the least we could do. When I heard you just died, I had the hardest time not crying. But if I started crying, I'd stop myself. <laughs> what am I doing? He's no longer in pain anymore. He's no longer in prison while his body was decaying cellularly. I, I have to keep telling myself, look, I know this hurts, but you know it would be eventually happened. It was going to happen and you knew that he was no longer in pain. I'd be living in a and living at a point when I'm always about to cry <laughs> until I was asked what would Warren want? <laughs> oh, and I would say that then I would I would stop and then I'd say he would want me to laugh and he'd want me to be happy. <sighs> Just give me a moment. Because after seeing such bad things happen to such good people, I need to pull myself together before I can put a smile on my face again. Oh, a silent applause. Thank you. <laughs> it, time heals all wounds, I know. It gets easier, but thank you.